According to the Bible, in Exodus and Deuteronomy and I think several other places, the sins of the fathers are visited upon the sons onto the third and fourth generations. The sins of the fathers visited upon the sons. Uh, that has always seemed to me to be uh, rather unfair. Um, but then, quite a few years ago, I encountered this phenomenon in, of all places, psychoanalytic societies. Um, in many psychoanalytic societies, a founding father has from time to time been found to be corrupt, psychopathic, to everyone's horror, shock, and amazement. We all want to believe that psychoanalysis makes us better people, that someone who has been analyzed and trained as a psychoanalyst could not turn out to be a charlatan, corrupt, sociopathic, but alas, that's just wishful thinking. The founder of the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society turned out to have been sleeping with many of his women patients for years. Um, okay. But then what is interesting is the people that corrupt analyst analyzed are now brought under suspicion as if the sins of the father analyst has been visited upon the son because his father analyst was corrupt he is tainted in the minds of many and he remains tainted he remains under a kind of suspicion, a prejudice, that somehow he's likely to have inherited some of this corruption from his analyst. Unless, that is, he undergoes a kind of purification ritual. In Orthodox Judaism, uh, they have the mikvah. A woman uh, and her husband are not permitted to have intercourse while she is menstruating. Uh, when her menstruation ends, she goes through a ritual bath, and only after that purification can marital intercourse resume. Okay, in psychoanalytic societies, the analyst who was analyzed by an analyst who turned out to be corrupt has to go through the ritual purification of a second analysis uh, with conducted by an analyst who has not yet been shown to be corrupt. I'm not suggesting all analysts are corrupt, but uh, in any case, uh, the analyst now under suspicion has to find an analyst in good standing and conduct, go into another analysis to purify himself of the suspicion that he has been corrupted, contaminated by his contact with the uh, corrupt analyst. Okay, um, this is pretty bizarre. For a while I thought it was a peculiarity of, um, uh, of psychoanalysts who would think this way. I mean, it's always seemed to me to be bizarre. Why can't one, why can't a corrupt analyst do some good work outside the area of his corruption? Okay, say this senior analyst has been sleeping with women patients, but, um, but in this case, the patient is a young male psychiatrist or psychotherapist who's training to be an analyst. The analyst uh, isn't sleeping with male patients, only with certain female patients. 
So why is this young man now under suspicion? I guess the idea is that the corruption is somehow contagious, um, that in identifying with one's analyst, will, one will somehow unconsciously have identified with that analyst's area of corruption. Uh, the analyst has turned out to have defective superego, and I would say conscience functioning, and somehow the idea is that his patient has somehow inherited this superego and conscience defect and will be suspected of having inherited it until he purifies himself with the second analysis. Okay, I thought it was sort of peculiar to psychoanalysis, and then I, increasingly I've come to recognize if, that of course it is not peculiar to psychoanalysis. Most people think this way. In fact, uh, the psychological and social sciences seem to rest on this assumption that we owe our personalities to others. Well, that's relational psychoanalysis. Uh, we are the products, we believe, of our parents and early influences, nannies, teachers. Our personalities are built up through identificatory processes. We take the others inside, we introject them. They live on in us as introjected, internalized objects. Well, when people stop to think of it, they have to acknowledge that there is biology. Uh, there are constitutional factors, hereditary, biological factors. Um, this is often not paid much attention to. I guess it is in psychiatry, uh, where there is a great investment in trying to believe that mental illness is um, essentially a brain disease. Um, but in psychoanalysis, the broad assumption is that um, we become who we are through the influences, including the sociocultural influences, of course and educational influences and influences from peer groups. We are built up in these ways, but in psychoanalysis particularly, we become who we are through the parenting that we received. And therefore the assumption seems to be that good parents will produce good children and bad parents will likely produce bad children. But is this true? Doesn't seem to be true. Seems to be the case that bad parents sometimes produce good children. Well, the word produce implies the one-way causation in any case. So let's, let's not put it that way. Sometimes bad parents, crazy parents, antisocial parents, Mentally ill parents, alcoholic parents, perverse parents sometimes end up having kids who turn out to be pretty healthy and pretty good people. How can that happen? Our theories would seem to suggest that it couldn't happen. How can a kid become good when the parents are so bad and crazy. How can that be? Can we account for that? No, our whole way of thinking goes against that. Good parents sometimes have bad kids. Bad parents sometimes have good kids. But here we have a case in psychoanalysis where a bad analyst well, that means his analysands are going to be bad. 
are going to likely be bad. Maybe they'll be bad. Well, we better put them through a purification ritual. So, I think we need to do some rethinking here. All of this causal explanation, as if the child is simply clay, to be shaped by especially the parental forces that it is exposed to, as if there are no other factors as if there are no mysteries, and certainly as if there is no free will and responsibility, as if there is no choice. Some people make bad choices. They wind up in a bad place. Are the parents responsible for those choices? Some people make good choices. They wind up in a good place despite all of the bad influences stemming from their families. Okay, the existential psychoanalysts uh, try to, to, to bring free will into the picture to a degree, but most psychoanalytic thinking has resisted this. Freud himself was a complete determinist. He spoke of the illusion of free will. And yet, on the other hand, he talked about the goal of therapy as freeing us from our inhibitions, symptoms, and anxiety. But he doesn't believe in freedom. But nevertheless, the therapy is intended to free us. Bit of a contradiction there that Freud never managed to resolve. Anyway, let's bring freedom into the picture. Let's bring biology into the picture. Let's bring constitutional factors into the picture. Let's recognize how oversimplified and one-sided our thinking has been, resulting in these bizarre aberrations where a young analyst's career can be negatively impacted because of the sins of his analyst. The sins of the fathers will be visited upon the sons onto the third or fourth generation. I think we need to grow up.